So I'm Richard, this is Daniel, and we're going to talk about the circuit breaker pattern in JavaScript. And as I was saying before, we probably could have done a better job of titling this, because unless you know what a circuit breaker pattern is, you, it might not be that obvious. Um, but it's essentially a way to isolate communication between web services in a distributed system. Um, so go back a little way. Uh, Yammer started as a pretty standard Rails app. Um, but as we start to scale our project and add features, we found that we hit scaling problems pretty soon. Uh, so we needed to rethink parts of our architecture. Um, we started by extracting a messaging service called Feedy, which we built on the JVM. So one of the first scaling problems we hit was with our how we were storing messages. Um, we actually got to over a billion rows in Postgres in our message table. So we clearly need to rethink how we did this. Um, and we implemented Feedy, but to represent the scalable representation of conversations using just the message IDs. And then the actual content of the messages was stored in Rails still. So whilst that didn't change things that much, moving this stuff out into a separate service and a separate data store allowed us to dramatically reduce the load on our Rails app and also reduce the amount of stuff we needed to store in our Postgres database. So Feedy worked really well, and as we have continued to scale our uh, system and add new features, we've essentially followed that same approach. Uh, so we now have over 20 services, um, so things like Fileville, which is our upload service, uh, Mugshot, which resizes images, uh, Paddy, which is a uh, like collaborative editor thing. Um, and this has provided us with quite a few benefits. So the most obvious one probably is uh, being able to horizontally scale each service independently. So if we need to add capacity for Feedy, we can do that really easily without uh, increasing capacity over the whole system. Um, it's also allowed to separate concerns, so understanding what each service does is much easier as it's a separate code base than it would be if it was part of the like one massive repository. And it's also much easier to deploy these things. So if we make a change to Mugshot, we can easily deploy that one service without having to take the risk of deploying the entire system. Um, and finally, uh, it also improves uh, the fault tolerance of Yammer. So if one service goes down, ideally at least, it shouldn't bring other things down with it. It should be um, separated. Uh, whereas if you have a single app, then that's a single point of failure. And if that goes down, then there's not very really much you can do by separating things out into different services, it's allowed us to uh, degrade gracefully when things go wrong. So this is a little out of date, actually, but it gives you a rough idea of what our architecture looks like. Um, and it also shows some of the problems with this. So whilst uh, building things in a service-orientated way has given us a lot of benefits, it, dev it does definitely in uh, increase the complexity of the system as a whole. So each service is easier to understand, but that largely just pushes stuff out into uh, com complications with how things communicate with each other and how those services are coordinated. Um, maintaining API contracts is also much more difficult because you might make a change in one part of the system and it will have uh, very big, profound uh, problems in other parts of the system that you weren't aware would, would be affected. Um, and this also relates to debugging. So when you get a bug report, tracing those symptoms back to the actual root cause is, is far more difficult because instead of it being due to an isolate, isolated part of the system, it's usually a result of lots of things interacting uh, together and causing a problem. Um, and then finally, handling failing dependencies really needs to be thought of upfront. So the fault tolerance I mentioned on the previous slide doesn't really come for free. You've got to think about how to handle the dependencies of each service when they go down. Um, because if you don't, that will also bring your own service down, and that will potentially cascade through the rest of the system. So to look at this in a bit more detail, we're going to take a look at our Completely service, which is our web service for providing autocomplete results. Um, so if you pass the name Bob, it will return all of the Bobs in your network. Um, but on a large network, that could be hundreds of names, and we don't want to force our users to search through that list. So um, we use another service called Pranky, which, rec which ranks things in relation to you. So Completely uses this to uh, sort its list based on how likely you are to want to contact that person, and then passes back the most 10 or, like 10 or 20 most relevant users. Um, but with this pattern, if Pranky goes down, then if we don't think about this at all, then that's also going to bring down Completely. 
Uh, if it fails quickly with a 500 error, we can at least handle the error normally and continue on. Um, but if prank is just unavailable, then the request is likely to time out, which means we'll have to wait for that to complete before we can pass any information back to the user. Um, and we also need to do this every time. So every time Completely makes a request to Pranky, even if we know that's likely to time out, we still need to make that call and, and wait for it to fail before we can actually continue. Um, and worse than that, if anything actually relies on Completely, then this latency could cause failures, which then start to cascade through the rest of the system. So one way of dealing with this is the circuit breaker pattern. Uh, circuit breaker pattern uh, monitors requests being made between services and records any errors that are thrown. And if enough errors are thrown to go over a specified error threshold, then the circuit breaker is broken. And at that point, all requests are short-circuited and don't actually get passed on to the service. Um, we then allow periodic retries to test the current health of the system. So we don't want to permanently disable uh, a feature, for example. Um, so in our example, the circuit breaker was sit between Completely and Pranky. Um, and as long as these requests are successful, they'll just get passed through as normal. Um, but if Pranky goes down, then it will let a few more requests through, but it will record those as errors. And once enough errors have come through, it will uh, go over the error threshold, and it will open the circuit breaker. So at that point, it will short circuit the requests, and they won't actually get passed on to Pranky. This allows completely to fail fast and not wait for timeouts to occur. Um, and you can actually then specify a fallback, which will happen in that case. So in completely's sense, it will um, just return the unsorted list of results, which obviously isn't as good as returning more relevant results, but it at least means that our application can continue to function in some way when there's a failure in part of our system. Um, it also has some other benefits over standard error handling in that you can report when a circuit breaker is opened and then log that somewhere so you can get an idea of when your system is facing problems. Um, and it also prevents you from hammering the same service when it's already down, which will make it far more difficult to recover when there is a problem. So we use Hystrix uh, on our backend services, which is a Java library built by Netflix. Um, there's a few really good blog posts about how this works, and the, the uh, documentation is really great, so it's pretty easy to see what it's doing. Um, it also has a sister project which provides a real-time dashboard, so this will log when any circuit breakers uh, are opened, and you can see that here and, and monitor any problems you might have with your application. Um, but what about client-side calls? Um, in our application, in our example, sorry, the completed service is only ever called from the browser, and if completed goes down, then we're going to face the same kind of problems that we did when Pranky went down. We'll have timeouts delaying user interaction, and we won't actually know that Completely has gone down potentially if it's in an unrecoverable state. So we really need something to sit between browser requests and Completely to monitor requests coming through, uh, record er any errors that happen, and then deal with uh, that case when it does. Um, so we've essentially implemented Hystrix in the browser, or at least a simplified version of it, um, and released that on GitHub. So Daniel's going to talk a bit more about the specifics of that. Right. So our implementation is pretty similar to what Hystrix is doing in the Java side of things. What we do is we keep track of the results of every command that gets executed through the circuit breaker. So we know the number of successes, failures, timeouts, and short circuits, which are commands that failed because the circuit was open. And we only keep track of these results for a certain amount of time, which we call the window, which in our example is 10 seconds. We divide the window into buckets, in this case into 10 buckets, so we have each bucket containing one second of command executions. What happens is that every second an old bucket rolls off the window and the new bucket rolls in. So we're only keeping track of the last 10 seconds of executions. The values in these buckets determine if the circuit breaker is open or closed. So what we do is, after every command, we calculate the percentage of failed requests. So we sum up the failures and timeouts and divide it by the total number of executions. And that gives us the error percentage. If the error percentage is under a certain threshold, which may be 50%, so if the error percentage is under 50%, then uh, we let the circuit breaker closed and commands execute normally. But if the error percentage is over the threshold, 
then the circuit breaker will open and any commands that come after this one will fail instantly. But the service may recover at some point. So every once in a while, we have to check the status of the service somehow. What we do is, after the circuit breaker has opened, we, let, we wait for one full window. So in our example, that was 10 seconds. So we wait for 10 seconds, and then we let a single command execute. If the service is still down and the command fails, then the circuit breaker will remain open. But if the service has recovered and the, the command executes successfully, then the, the circuit breaker will become closed and any commands that come after this one will execute normally. The API is really straightforward. So you just instantiate a new circuit breaker for your service. Here we have completely breaker and we pass the necessary configuration. So here we're saying that the length of the window is 10 seconds. Uh, we're dividing that window into 10 buckets. We're also saying that the timeout duration is three seconds, which I'll explain in the next slide. We're also setting the error threshold to 50%. So when we calculate the error percentage for a window, if it's over this threshold, then the circuit breaker will open. And we're also setting a volume threshold which is the minimum number of commands that have to execute before we start calculating stats. And why is this even necessary? Well, imagine if you instantiate a new circuit breaker and the first command that you execute happens to fail. Then you would have a 100% error rate and the circuit breaker would open immediately. So you want to avoid that situation and that's why we have the volume threshold. We wait for, in this example, five commands to execute and then we start calculating the stats. So now we have our circuit breaker and we want to run commands through it. A command is just a function which receives a success and a failure callback. Um, and you can do whatever you need to do inside that function and then you just need to notify the circuit breaker of the result. So here we're calling completely results which is probably making an AJAX request if the request is successful, we call the success callback. If it fails, we call the failure callback. And this is where the timeout comes into play. If neither the success nor the failure callbacks are called after three seconds, then we flag this command as a timeout. So we have our command to run it through the circuit breaker. We just call breaker.run and we pass the command. We can also pass an optional second parameter, which is the fallback which only gets executed if the circuit breaker is open. So if the circuit has broken, it skips the command execution and invokes the fallback directly. In the fallback, you can call some other service or maybe let the user know that the system is in a down state. And after the command has run, we update the statistics and uh, set the, the state of the circuit breaker to be open or closed. And that's it really. It's Pretty simple. All right. Um, so in summary, um, circuit breakers allow you to fail fast when there's a problem and uh, degrade gracefully to other solutions. Um, they can prevent failures cascading through your, the rest of your system. So you isolate points of communication to prevent problems uh, going through to other services. And they let you discover any problems early and allow you to more easily recover when they do happen. And uh, that's it. So yeah. Do you have any questions or et cetera? Pretty cool. Uh, sitting beside Brian here, and uh, he had a question. Can you go back to that uh, diagram of services that you have on your slides? Yeah, this is like about two years out of date, I think. But uh, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh. Um, is nothing connected to Wario because he's a jerk? <laughs> um, what is Wario? I think it's only accessed by the browser. Right, it's, yeah. Okay. That's yeah. It, why it doesn't appear yeah. here. Oh. Yeah, I think that's an error thing. Yeah. I don't remember what that does, actually. I think Wario it's, never yeah. fails. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Wario he doesn't exists fail. in the browser. <laughs> Sounds about right. Uh, any other questions? Oh, we're five minutes late? <laughs> really? No, no, we're breaking until four, I think, so we've got a shitload of time. I'm, I'm basically just eating time right now. 
<laughs> all right, well, if people have questions, they can, we'll be around, so. Cool, all right, thanks guys. Uh, we'll be back at four. <laughs>